Hello, Laura J here with Michael Seegers in the first podcast for the Peaceful Inner Warriors United series that is intended to bring you hope and inspiration during charged times and also introduce you to people who are further down the path that we are all transcending and scaling together individually. And today, the first podcast I wanted to bring to you is with Michael speaking into the nature of spiritual warfare and the nature of evil. So that we understand it is not just about what we see, but the invisible war that is taking place now that we are all subject to rules we may not understand, but others do. And Michael is one of those who has founded and is the program director for the Shambhala Temple of Light in Richmond Hill. And so I look forward to sharing a man who has dedicated more than 40 years of his life to teachings of the Ascended Masters like Jesus and Buddha and others who have risen in awareness. And that is all I need to say to introduce Michael this way for you to now speak into what is spiritual warfare, Michael? Thank you, Laura. People often comment that they're having a spiritual experience. And I think it's also fairly common that people speak the reverse and identify themselves as spiritual beings having a human experience. And for the most part, in our mainstream reality, the experience that we are conditioned to culturally is what is provided by our five senses and pretty much indoctrinated by consensus opinion and what is seen on the news. And I think there's a growing recognition these days that the narrative that's being offered doesn't match with what we innately understand because the facts do not appear to be true. And indeed, that is the condition that the ancients in the Sanskrit language call Maya. It is the illusion of the apparent reality and the deeper truth is clearly of a spiritual nature and there is an interesting history that this planet has and indeed that this solar system and that this galaxy has and there's a history of warfare spiritual warfare and it plays out in spiritual dimensions as well as in physical dimensions and we experience that in all kinds of uncomfortable situations and it is truly an attack upon us and it's a very intelligent and a very calculated and orchestrated attack and it occurs in ways that most people have never imagined and it is intensifying in in these days with these current events it is absolutely intensifying And so the message of hope that we bring is that there are remedies and there are many physical remedies that people are becoming aware of. And there are very, very intelligent people in this world that are standing up and bringing forth this information. And to a lesser degree, there are people bringing forward spiritual remedies. And we would like to share some of that today. uh, And and really bring in a, a broader perspective and a greater understanding of really what's going on and so one of the things that uh, i've been fortunate to be blessed with is uh, access to ancient knowledge and multicultural so that i've studied uh, sacred scriptures from all the world's great religions and i've found common themes in the ancient vedic literature in the hebrew texts in Christian and Islamic traditions in the Far East. And I think 
most aware people today recognize that the evidence is everywhere that humans are not the only ones who have ever been on this planet. And when we think about aliens or extraterrestrials, we often think in terms of physical spacecraft. And we don't commonly consider spiritual dimensions, demonic worlds, black magic, evil of that nature, which does coexist in our reality and for the most part remains imperceptible. Doesn't make it any less real. And so there's a history that's told and it's probably one of the easiest ones for people to access and, and research for themselves. And it's told through a book, it's called the Book of Enoch. And it's a book that was removed from the collection of literature that eventually became the Bible. And it was re removed for a purpose because the people who assembled the Bible, the bishops of the Council of Nicaea, really didn't want the world to know what Enoch had to say. And so part of this narrative involves an understanding of the subject we call reincarnation and karma. And if you can accept the fact that this is not the only lifetime that we have, that we have been on this earth and on other worlds through multiple experiences, it becomes easier to accept the idea that there is a very intelligent agenda being perpetrated to prevent certain types of information from getting out. And it goes back all the way to that point where the Bible was created more than 1500 years ago, when Enoch's revelation about the fallen angels and the Nephilim and the extraterrestrials and his warnings to us were made almost impossible for people to access. And Enoch tells the story about, and Enoch, by the way, was the grandfather of Noah. And we understand that the great flood in Noah's Ark that most people have heard about, it was actually the flood that occurred, which was the sinking of Atlantis. So Noah was an Atlantean. And people lived for a thousand years in those days. And the reason that the Lords of Karma chose to sink that continent was to put an end to an evil that was rampant, that was out of control. And we see mythological evidence in the idea of creatures like unicorns and centaurs. And the centaur is a good example because it was a half man, half beast. And these things actually existed. And this was done in Atlantean laboratories by scientists who had an advanced genetic engineering technology. And it was an alien technology. And there was a crossbreeding of, of humans and animals, and there was a crossbreeding of, shall we say, demons and, and, and humans and animals. And it was just, it was horrific. So an end was put to that by the sinking of the continent. And Noah, as a survivor, brought the records of what Enoch had told. And it was the story about how there had been a war in the heavens. And this is described very briefly in what's left in the Bible today in the final book, which is called the book of Revelation. And a gentleman named John on the Isle of Patmos receiving inspired vision directly from Jesus wrote the book of Revelation. And there's a line in there that says, woe unto you mankind for the devil walks among you and he has a great wrath. And he was talking about that during the war in heaven, Archangel Michael cast Lucifer out of heaven, forced him into a physical plane existence here on planet earth. And many of the fallen angels came with him and they are embodied in physical vehicles like we were. And there are actually, as Enoch describes, several orders of these shall we say, um, different types of beings. So Lucifer was known to be an archangel, had high attainment. 
And there was another order that were called the Watchers, and they were of even higher attainment than the Archangels. They were immensely powerful cosmic beings. And they also were cast out of heaven. They had committed abominable sins, and they had lusted after human females and interbred with them and produced races of giants and brought all manner of horrors upon the earth. And these individuals, the watchers and Your attention, please. hold on. Your attention, please. I have an alert this my building. building security. They will be testing up the fire alarm. Elevator operation. Classic interference. Their is what happens when the darkness senses the light is gaining in power. So you who are watching on Facebook and you who will listen later are part of the collective, which is what we have an opportunity now to reach in terms of a tipping point in collective consciousness where we finally wake up and say, we choose to be bearers of the light as we were always intended to be, rather than to let the fallen angels guide us astray, lead us astray. Wonder why marijuana was legalized recently? Wonder why the common saying is, choose your poison? There are ways to keep us asleep to the power that is inside of us. And classical interference will show up when the darkness senses the light is gaining power. So when we are doing work that is of the light and of a higher nature, like what this is now, oftentimes spiritual attack takes place as well. Yeah, so we're going to hear the fire alarm a few times throughout this. <laughs> so that's, that's a little bit humorous. I did extra work this morning, increasing the force field of protection. I did receive an insight about that it would be necessary. And I did feel a very oppressive energy this morning that was attempting to put me to sleep. And it's, it's just part of the tactics. It's uh, part of how they operate. And it's, uh, it's why we bring forth spiritual remedies, because often people experience the kind of symptoms that they can't explain and, and wonder what is causing this. And um, they just don't know what are the weapons and tools that are being used against them. So some, some of the information people have been coming into tune with, like chemtrails and harp transmitters and understanding weather manipulation, uh, it's, it's so insidious in our culture in terms of what is in our food supply and uh, you know, the, the danger of something as simple as sugar and, and the history of sugar and, and what kind of a poison that is to the mind and to the finer equipment that we have because we're not just physical vehicles. Our, our vehicles have an innate sensitivity to be able to attune to much higher frequencies and to be clairvoyant and to be clairaudient and to engage the faculties of the soul in much higher planes of awareness. And all that is dampened and, and dumbed down by chemical influence, by things like sugar, by things like chocolate, by things like drugs and, and entertainment and types of music and what I call sonic assault, which is a particular absolutely toxic rhythm that is very common in, in today's music. And when one begins, here we go. <laughs> you have to laugh. You have to laugh. When yeah, so you can imagine this is how the opposition feels right now. They're having a panic, <laughs> like a five alarm blaze. Yeah. Because here's a guy speaking the truth and it's going out on the airwaves. But these, uh, these things that have been common in culture and have become habitual in behavior are actually impediments to the unfoldment of the higher faculties and the ability to expand the consciousness into higher dimensions. And so some of uh, what we like to offer at Shambhala Temple of Light in bringing forth the teachings of the Son of Masters is tools and technology, which are spiritual technology and exercises that begin to become daily practice uh, to pull oneself out of the swamp of this density of consciousness 
and really rise into the higher realms of light so that one's experience 24 7 can be absolutely of the light and live impeccably and fearlessly and get through the type of challenges that appear overwhelming in the mainstream understanding they don't need to be uh, so these these dynasties of fallen angels and watchers that have been with us for literally millions of years continue to re-embody and control the, the bloodlines and uh, based on their particular karma, uh, perpetuate these families that are in the positions of power that we see in royal families, in banking cartels, in pharmaceutical industry, sitting on boards of directors, controlling many aspects of our lives, um, all with a very calculated agenda, all been going on for a very, very long time. So that is a, a bit of an introduction to the subject of spiritual warfare. It, it, it's an explanation of what we're seeing out playing here in the world today. And there is an agenda that's not a friendly agenda and it does not have our best interests at heart. And those of us who wake up to this realization at least can begin to prepare ourselves uh, to endure and eventually thrive again, which is what we've been put here to do, we need to come into a much more profound understanding of the fact that we are not just spiritual beings, but we are all part of the one being that exists. And you can call it God, and you can call it source, you can call it what you want, but there is only one existence in all of the universes. And we're all a part of it. We're all divine beings. And we've had that knowledge taken from us, withheld from us, and we've been conditioned through the educational system of our culture and our parents and what they knew and believed and were taught. We've been conditioned to believe that we are just this little worthless sinner of a human being with very limited capabilities. And the truth is we are infinite beings with infinite potential. And all we really need to do is go through a process of unfolding that. And there are many types of processes that have been available. People have gone through religious schools and yoga schools and philosophical schools. Um, we prefer to call our environment a mystery school. We teach the inner mysteries that are generally not available to the mainstream consciousness, but have always been available to those who are ready to raise their vibration and come into a higher consciousness. And really reclaim our divinity because we are divine beings and when we recognize that we are connected to source we are not separate from source we have access to the infinite power of source we have access to the hierarchies of archangels and cosmic beings who are absolutely of the light who will reinforce us who will gird us and strengthen us and assist us to stand in the face of any challenge and tools that we offer are based on an understanding that this particular battleground is not a battleground for humans. Humans will never win this. Humans will play a part, and there are many parts to play. But as spiritual warfare, it truly is a battle for the archangels. And because of free will, they may not interfere. They must be invited. And therefore, when we call them into action, they may enter our world, and they do so instantaneously. And it is the archangels who will achieve the victory. And it's our job to call them into this on a daily, on an hourly basis. And so... There's one Archangel I would love to introduce people to, and that's Archangel Michael. I was named after him. Uh, I asked my mother when I was a young boy why she chose this name, and she told me that I was named after Archangel Michael. And I just took that to heart. And throughout my life, chose to embody all that I understood what Archangel Michael stands for. 
And so uh, in the Catholic tradition, there is an Archangel Michael rosary. There are prayers to Archangel Michael. We have a very, very simple one that we like to teach people. It's called traveling protection. And it's so simple that when you speak these words, you are calling the presence of Archangel Michael into your world to surround you, to protect you. And it's just, it's a very powerful thing to have. And it doesn't take very long. I'll say the words for you right now. Lord Michael before, Lord Michael behind, Lord Michael to the right, Lord Michael to the left, Lord Michael above, Lord Michael below, Lord Michael, Lord Michael, wherever I go, I am his love protecting here. I am his love protecting here. I am his love protecting here. And you can develop that with a rhythm where it becomes almost like a song that you sing. I've taught it to children who love to do it on the way to school. And it just brings so much light into your world and it brings a force for the protection into your world that you really don't want to be without in these challenging times. And so if you remember that the story is told, it, it was Archangel Michael who cast Lucifer out of heaven. He is the captain of the Lord's hosts. The Lord's hosts? Hosts. The hosts of the Lord are, are the angelic hosts. So all the angels in heaven are called the Lord's hosts. And so Archangel Michael is one of the best friends you could ever want to have. And certainly not the only one, but he's a very good starting point for this conversation that we're having. And, and later on, we like to introduce Archangel Gabriel, the angel of the Annunciation, who announces and brings the news to you. Uh, Archangel Uriel, who's involved in the judgment of the fallen angels, and, and many others. But we begin with Archangel Michael in this very simple traveling protection and it just, uh, it, it needs to be part of people's spiritual practice if, if they want to invite Archangel Michael into their life. And, and later on, we go into more advanced teachings and, and how to call the, the Archangel to do the type of battle work. It's not something for beginners, but it's something that I think people in your audience will want to move toward understanding. And uh, it's something that will you know, progressively make available to them. But at least in the beginning, Lord Michael before, Lord Michael behind, Lord Michael to the right, Lord Michael to the left, Lord Michael above, Lord Michael below, Lord Michael, Lord Michael, wherever I go, I am his love protecting here, I am his love protecting here, I am his love protecting here. It's, it's like having a sword at your side, a very, very powerful tool in our spiritual arsenal. To cut through the veils that evil is, if we actually break down the word, like in one of the four pillars, which this book, Alchemy, um, St. Germain on Alchemy, Formulas for Self-Transformation, this is one of the four pillars of the teachings of the Ascended Masters, and St. Germain actually brought in the violet flame to gift it to humanity to transmute karma for ourselves personally as well as collectively, correct? Absolutely, and, and that is the other tool that we teach in the beginning is, is the use of the violet flame because everything that it touches, it transmutes, it raises the vibration, into its natural pristine state and restores the energy to wholeness and balance. So the violet flame is something that everybody wants to have in the daily practice. And it also must be called forth using the science of the spoken word. And St. Germain gave us a mantra to do this. It's a very, very simple mantra. Recognizing that everything that we say after the words I am is what we actually bring into manifestation because I am is the name of God. And we just say, I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. And we develop that mantra with a rhythm and turn that into almost like a little song throughout the day. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. You can do that throughout the day whenever you have a moment. And it brings the violet flame into your world. And the violet flame surrounds every molecule cell atom in your being in your aura cleanses it purifies it transmutes the negative energy is described by saint germain as the supreme antidote will neutralize any poison emf radiation genetically modified organisms chemtrails toxic air pollution 
anger, hatred, negative emotion, and I think most importantly, karma. We carry a burden of negative karma from thousands of lifetimes that we've had. And we are responsible for that karma. It's our job to deal with all the energy that's ever passed through us and what we've done with it. And every misqualification, every imperfect thought, word, and deed, every time we did something that was harmful to life, we are responsible for that. And the wonder of the violet flame is that it actually transmutes that energy, all that karmic reservoir, and cleans it up and moves us much closer to our goal, which is becoming, as the masters have become, which is become an ascended master. That's the purpose of life. It's a very simple purpose, not so easy to do, but there is a pathway to that self mastery that leads us eventually to the condition whereby we become completely liberated from the restraints of the physical universe and have total control over the physical elements and can levitate and teleport and travel between dimensions and do everything that these masters do. Which may to some seem like this is completely out of any realm of familiarity because it may well be, it's not readily taught. But even the CIA did a 20 year experiment on humans to create the gateway experiment where they talk about the time space continuum and human potential to be able to actually instantaneously connect with others who are on that wavelength of resonance, which is frequency, because everything is frequency, including E veil, the veils that keep us separated from our own divine nature, of which this allows us to return. Because when we strip off all of the expectations of who we thought we needed to be in order to be enough, we get back to the fact that we always were, which is why babies are in love with everything about themselves, including their feces. Until then, somebody says something that makes them. <gasps> And even Don Miguel Ruaz in The Four Agreements, which is a Toltec wisdom guide, speaks about sin in terms of it being when we speak against ourselves or someone else. So to sin is to use the spoken word violently, which is when we insert negativity into the power of the violet flame. I like what you described because everything that comes into existence does so through speaking. It is said in sacred scriptures in not just one tradition. We, we read this in the Bible, but it originates in the Vedas that in the beginning was the word and the entire universe was created because it was spoken into existence by the creator. And so everything that we speak is tremendously powerful and we manifest everything that we say. And when we speak negatively, we produce negative conditions and that does create an energy veil, an E veil, that really brings us to be more distant from our source, more unable to be in tune with our source because we continue to just create a, a density of consciousness that, that makes it inaccessible. So our, our speaking is very important. And what you were saying about the, the CIA, I think it's probably true that even the CIA doesn't have the highest level of understanding and technology. There are organizations that we don't know the names of. Uh, some of the information that I've been privy to uh, reveals technology beyond what I'm sure this, even they have. Uh, we believe in, in classic physics, we're taught that the speed of light is the highest speed that you can attain, and yet, I'm aware of the fact that there is uh, a shuttlecraft that goes from here to Alpha Centauri twice a week. And Alpha Centauri is the nearest star, is, is several light years away. How do you have a shuttle going twice a week? It's, it's, a, it's a mode of travel that's faster than light speed. And that exists here on Earth. And there are technologies that exist here on Earth that we're not told about in the mainstream that are probably a million years beyond what we have in our university level physics classes. So there's, there's a lot going on that's not being told. 
there's the part of me that really wants to address the systemic influence of an abusive parental model as the way that it seems humanity is being ruled currently, that these teachings are more centered in the unconditional love of where we came from and return to and are part of the whole time just feeling separate from while we're in these containers of our bodies. And that abusive parental model is part of that if you look at a child that's abused, ultimately they still revere the parents and want nothing more for those parents to love them. And it just, you would hope that a parent would have their child's best interest at heart, but doesn't necessarily, it seems. And I bring this in because that is from my perspective, the model that we are currently operating under. I've not heard that terminology in that way, abusive parental model. I think that um, the part of us that is human, the biological, is very much subject to conditioning in the way that we see even condition and train animals. And so when you are engineering a society with a particular agenda of control and indoctrinating people through fear and creating things like World War I and World War II, what our parents had to endure, and my parents uh, endured the Nazi invasion of Amsterdam. And my father was 10 years old and my mother was 10 years old and, and they lived through that and it was horrific. And it's, it emotionally scarred them. They were never able to, to get over that. And, and a lot of that influence, I and my seven brothers and sisters were subjected to. It was part of our growing up. And it was, it was very powerful influence. There's, a, I think, a perspective that's helpful, and that's to understand that notwithstanding all of that, it's, it, it's all part of the karmic package that we came into this embodiment to experience. So there is always an opportunity to learn from adversity and grow through that. But it, it doesn't certainly change the fact that it's discomforting. And uh, for many people, overwhelming. But it truly is by design by the overlords that control society. And they've had an agenda uh, for how the education system exists today. What we have is a German model. The whole idea of kindergarten, which is a German word, um, was designed to produce an obedient society of workers. They didn't want thinkers, uh, certainly didn't want free thought. They just wanted obedient workers. And so people have grown up into that with a tremendously limited concept of who they are and what they're permitted to do and what they're supposed to do. And um, unfortunately, emotions, being as strong as they are, tend to rule the behavior for the most part. And until people can develop some kind of self-mastery and gain some control over their emotions and their speaking, uh, they're going to continue to just amplify and intensify the momentums that are running through them and, and through their environment. What is a belief other than a thought that has been repeated enough times we develop an emotional charge because of the familiarity that it makes us feel safe with that then we say, oh, I believe that. It's familiar to me. It feels certain. Very much so. And habit is like water running creating a groove, creating a deep track, becoming a Grand Canyon, and try to now change the direction of that flow. And it requires tremendous effort. And when we look at emotion, it's energy in motion. And it is very well known that emotional energy travels much faster than thought. Because how often do you say something that you regret and wish you hadn't said it, but you weren't able to, con flow, to control that flow of that emotional energy as it was coming through your speaking. It takes tremendous discipline to guard the tongue 
and really ensure that what is flowing through you is a blessing and not a bane to all of life. We must balance judgment with mercy. That's in the tree of life. Is it not? Absolutely. Um, and justice being the highest quality, the highest virtue that we could possibly seek to express based on truth, based on compassion, based on mercy. Uh, it does require tremendous balance to achieve. And if we look at Garden of Eden as the guard inside of energetic dens that we are, then we start to understand how powerful we are as the creators of the worlds that are seen for the second time, the first time it is in reality, which is the realistic evidence appearing legit in tomorrow's yesterday, that is what the reality we live in is the reflection of, not what is possible or what even is the potential within us, but only a reflection of our performance based on what we thought we could do until the day that comes when we say, hey, I am capable of more and I'm not here alone because Maya Angelou had said that I may stand before you as one, but I come before you as the 10,000 who came before me to make me who I am and to raise us up because we are humanity's best shot at maintaining freedom and actually allowing justice to prevail. And I would add to that, and, and that was so wonderfully spoken, um, it's helpful to consider that there is justice in the universe and that the lords of karma ensure that that does occur and that the people who are in embodiment on the earth today are the ones who are supposed to be here. It's like the coach will always put the best players on the field to do the proper job. When you need a field goal, you bring out your field goal kicker. When you need to change a quarterback, you bring in another quarterback. And we, as the players on the field, are the ones who actually have the ability to get the job done, to make this a better world. And so when shrinking into the smallness of self and the fear of what am I going to do, we have to reclaim our divinity and remember the greatness that is innate within us and seek to rise up and seek wise counsel and find good mentors and see who's gone before us. Because as Isaac Newton said, uh, if we've seen a little farther, it's because we've stood on the shoulders of giants. And truly, the teachers that have been available to us and the teachers that they have had have always had a greater vision and it is our job, it's our responsibility to empower ourselves and to seek and to learn and to grow and to become all that we can be. And we will get the job done and we shall be victorious. And the self is the C-E-L-L hyphen F that chooses between fear or faith as what fills the space in between of what we can see, I believe. Yeah, I like that. Uh, we must have faith, and I think it was Wayne Dyer who, who said, if you knew who walked behind you, if you knew who walked with you every step of the way, you would never fear. And it reminds me of the, the footprints prayer. And I think many people have seen the footprints prayer uh, about the man who's walking the beach and he was having the vision of his life. And there were two sets of footprints and there were parts of the journey where there was only one set of footprints. And, and the man asked God, I thought you were walking with me. How come there were parts of the journey there was only one set of footprints? And God responded, that's when I carried you. Yes. And we, do, we need to remember that, that God is with us, God is within us, God is a part of us. It's, 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 it's what and who we are. And God will always strengthen and gird us and protect us. As long as we continue to honor our spiritual heritage, our innate divinity, and make a spiritual practice of 
communing with the creator and finding ways to spend time in prayer or using invocations like the simple call to Archangel Michael or whatever it is that resonates with you culturally. And it might be chanting mantras in Sanskrit or in Chinese. Or it, it doesn't matter as long as one is accessing that, that spiritual source energy. Moving beyond our small self to tune into the big self or the big A of the all in all. Absolutely. I want before the end of this, because during these times, especially as the old paradigm falls and big truths are brought to the surface and it horrifies and completely defiles who a lot of us were trained to believe that we are as a people and as individuals within that collective. Mental health has a huge rise in terms of the crises that is now upon us. And there is not, from my experience, the help that is suggested is there within the mental health system because that is only addressing one aspect unless you have a really great teacher and there are many great there are many great light workers within the system and then there are others that are not and i experienced that from my own experience but i mentioned this because what i suspect is going to be happening and what already is happening with the quarantine that is currently in place and that is likely to come in the fall when we enter into what I've heard will be a six month lockdown is that suicide rates are going up big time already and are going to way more when the atrocities to humanity come to the surface in a bigger way. And I don't say all of this to propagate the fear as so many of the media outlets currently do, but I say it because there is actually an entity that brings suicide into the awareness of people as a viable option, that many who are listening or watching this now may have personally experienced, and certainly all of us have experienced someone else go through. And so if you would speak into the entity of suicide as part of this conversation about spiritual warfare, I feel it would be incredibly beneficial now as much as ever. That's an interesting subject. Um, I'm sure most people are familiar with the concept of exorcisms. And I'm sure there's a lot of question about, is that stuff real? And if so, what's going on there? And Demonic possession does exist, and there are entities of all kinds. There are thousands of different types of entities that, for the most part, we don't see. We see the effect of them uh, as, as the behaviors of people appear to be unhealthy. That is largely due to entities and of the types of entities that exist, uh, the suicide entity is one of the most dangerous and it works in conjunction with the gambling entity and it works in conjunction with drug and alcohol entities. Uh, there is a entity involved in smoking. The reason that uh, people have such a problem with nicotine addiction has a lot more to do with the nicotine entity than actually with the chemistry of nicotine itself. And so these, these entities are feeding off of the energy of the individual who is partaking of the substance. And uh, there are entities of depression. There are entities of lust. All destructive behaviors can be seen as rooted in the behavior, the, in the influence of entities. And so, these are tools of dark forces that have been specifically created to steal the light that constantly pours through us and to keep us subjugated and in a lower consciousness where we are simply tools and workers for an elite 
that lives off our effort. That it's not just the suicide entity, but all mental disease is rooted in entities. And the uh, understanding is helpful that everything that exists, whether it's appearing to be physical matter or energy, physical energy, spiritual energy, everything that exists is consciousness. Consciousness is the fabric of the universe. And so these entities are themselves conscious. They have a particular type of consciousness. And the idea that suicide is a way out or is a solution is absolutely false because where you end up being when this physical vehicle is put down, you continue to exist, but you will be existing in a realm with an equivalent vibration to what you were experiencing. So the fear, the despair, the whatever that you were experiencing, you're going to now be in a realm that is that very vibration. And it's a very, very distressing condition to be in. And then by law, by karmic law, you will be required to re-embody immediately. Normally, people have a waiting period between lifetimes suicides have to come back right away and so you'll be realizing that you have to come back into a condition of consciousness that is at least equal to the one that you left because you have to master that challenge and likely the conditions will be more uncomfortable and the challenge will be greater and so it truly is not a solution it's a horrific error and we need to find ways to embrace our support systems, our community, our family, whatever that we have around us and, and seek help and move through that crisis and become stronger because it's not an option to, to find a quick exit. It just is not. Unfortunately, the system in place currently to support people with mental dis-ease, cellular disharmony on the mental plane is not equipped to actually help people to the level that is required, which is the reason that tuning into spiritual practices and creating a spiritual practice that supports and reminds us of the essence within is so important now. It is not a fight for humanity. It is, it is a fight for humanity, but it is not a fight to be fought by humans alone. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So on that note, Michael, I would love to end this first podcast of the Peaceful Inner Warriors podcast. Um, I, would like to inter I would like to end this with asking you for your definition of what it means to be a warrior. I would say that a warrior is somebody that uh, takes a stand for truth and justice and is not willing to compromise their integrity and that they honor that throughout their life. Thank you. And certainly you are someone who has done that in my experience of you and I would love if anyone would be interested in connecting with Michael, you can do so through uh, email michael at shambhala temple of light.com and I will post that uh, below so that you are able to connect and reach out and know that you are not alone. And if you have questions around what it means to be a spiritual being, having a human experience, to know you are not alone in that and that we are all doing our best and that it is a climb of a mountaintop with many peaks. And ultimately, the best way to scale a mountain is to find fellow climbers who have went up higher and can offer insights and advice as to how to maneuver the next peak. And then the valley that comes from reaching that level of attainment, there is an equal and opposite to everything in this universe of polarity and understanding the foundation of the fact that spiritual warfare and e-veil truly is as real as 
what we are. And so therefore, we are not alone. And we have supports. And Michael Seegers is definitely one I'm grateful to have connected with in this lifetime. And I look forward to bringing more uh, to you with Michael. We're going to be doing a series that will be posted to YouTube for as long as that platform is willing to house us. And we will do our best to continue shining light in this dark space. So thank you very much for tuning in today. That is the end of our first podcast. Thank you.